Welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, or uh, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to EuroBioC 2020. Uh, my name is Davide Risto. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Padova in Italy. And um, I'll just give some briefs, uh, brief uh, opening remarks for the conference, and then I'll, um, we're going to get started. I see that people are slowly joining the session, so I'll uh, stall for a few seconds so that people can enter the room. And uh, we will get started in, in a few seconds. All right, so uh, welcome to EuroBioC 2020. Um, so we have a full week of uh, packed with talks and discussions and workshops and posters. So um, I want to be uh, just uh, very brief and give you a, all a welcome to this uh, very first edition, uh, very first virtual edition of the uh, European Bioconductor Meeting. And uh, especially want to thank all of you that contributed a talk or a poster or a discussion or a workshop uh, for uh, you know contributing to make this uh, uh, hopefully uh, very entertaining and, and useful event. Just a, a program at the glance, uh, we have eight keynotes addresses. We have 37 contributed talks and 12 contributed workshops. We'll be having four birds of a feather sessions. These are more informal discussions and 10 posters. And um, I think it is fair to say that it's probably the uh, richest EuroBioC ever in terms of uh, contributions. Um, so you may or may not know that this meeting was supposed to be happening uh, physically in Padova, and that's why I'm giving the <laughs> opening remarks. And I, I really wish I could um, uh, welcome you uh, in Padova and, and host you in this, uh, uh, which in my opinion is a, is a beautiful city. And uh, so I just wanted to have one slide on uh, you know, what could have been uh, in Padova, and uh, just to give you a, a really brief uh, sense of what uh, you know, what what you can see if you if you visit Padova sometime in the future. So Padova is is home of uh, you know the second oldest university in Italy and the fifth oldest in the world. Um, it's also home of the uh, oldest botanical garden, still in the uh, same location as you know when it started, and uh, the oldest anatomical theater also at the university. And then you know Padova is. It's sort of famous because Galileo was here teaching uh, during his more productive years. And um, uh, there's also another uh, gem in Padova, which is this Cappella degli Scoveni, which is um, you know, a beautiful uh, chapel uh, with uh, frescoes by Giotto. So um, I really hope that maybe in a few years we could have another one of these, uh, but uh, physically in Padova. So I'm a little sad that uh, you know, I cannot uh, welcome you here, and host you here in Padova. But on the other hand, um, I think we couldn't have done uh, such a global event if, we, if this was sort of a regular conference. And so I just want to show you, um, you know, what is EuroBioC 2020? It is truly a global event. We have more than 500 attendees from 49 countries, and uh, we cover six continents. Uh, we don't have anybody from Antarctica, but I'm not sure how the uh, connection uh, works there, so and, uh, even if there are people, but uh, all, all the other countries we we have them. So um, I'm I'm really I'm really proud of that 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 we were able to reach audiences not only in Europe but um, but throughout the globe. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we are able to uh, reach so many people across the world is that we were able to make this a free event, and we couldn't have done that without our sponsors. So. Really thank you to our sponsors at 1000 Research. You will see a booth in the arena um, part of the, of the conference platform, and you can check it out to see, you know, to learn more about them. Uh, we had general supports from the ARC Consortium and uh, support and the patronage of the Department of Statistical Sciences and the Department of Biology of the University of Padova. So thanks to all of them for, uh, for making this happen as a, as a free event. So um, again, I, I just want to be brief, but uh, I think there's some important information, sort of practical information that I want to give you before starting the conference. Uh, the first and most important one is that we have a code of conduct uh, as any bioconductor event. 
Uh, so we um, follow the uh, sort of project-wide code of conduct that you can find on the Bioconductor uh, website. Um, you, we also have a, a code of conduct, um, you know, two-point people uh, for that. Uh, so if you have some concerns or questions, you can email Orangato or Charlotte Sonnison or uh, code of conduct at bioconductor.org. Um, you can also uh, file a, an anonymous report at these uh, um, uh, link over here. Um, and uh, all of this information is available on the web Bioconductor website and on the conference website. So um, again, uh, you can check out the full code of conduct there. I just want to make uh, some uh, important points. The first and most important one is uh, uh, no harassment strict rule. Uh, so as a general rule, uh, you can uh, you know, think of it as focus on software and science and, and and keep it professional. Of course, we all want to have fun and have nice interactions, but please be respectful of everybody. Uh, this is the second thing I want to say is that this is a public forum and uh, we will be posting and, and, and the content of the presentations may be posted on social media. If you want to uh, post on social media or Twitter, you can use this uh, EuroBioC hashtag, EuroBioC2020. Uh, all the sessions will be recorded, and unless uh, the speakers opt out, they will be eventually posted on the Bioconductor YouTube channels and uh, Bioconductor website. Uh, so check that out later for, uh, you know, if you miss something live. And uh, uh, overall, I think the goal here is to maintain a welcoming every, uh, environment for everybody. So no bullying, no belittling, no making fun of others based on race, gender, um, you know, softer choices, um, you know, just, uh, just uh, keep it welcoming for everybody. Um, and this, importantly, does not only apply on the platform, but on all online forums, GitHub, Slack, support forum, um, uh, you know, just, uh, just as a general rule. So just uh, some practical uh, things about the platform. This is quite a, quite a new platform for us, but we find it uh, um, quite cool, actually, and, and hopefully it's going to work well throughout the conference. So don't click on this uh, while I'm talking, because otherwise you will leave the sessions. But you will see on the left side, you have some symbols. Um, uh, I guess you know the, the main one is sessions. Well, you will get to the schedule for the conference, and you will be able to join sessions if the sessions are happening in that moment. Or you can also add them to your schedule to kind of have a, a uh, you know, personalized schedule for the conference. Uh, the other uh, very exciting area that is uh, in this platform is the lounge. In the lounge, you will find tables where you can sit and, and, and mingle with, uh, with other attendees. Um, there are overall like 50 tables with eight seats in each table. So, uh, you know, you can um, uh, go and check out um, this area if you're in between sessions, or if there's a session that you don't, don't want to follow, you can go to the lounge. And there's also this uh, nice uh, speed networking feature that will uh, sort of match you randomly with another attendee. So if you, if you like that, uh, um, that, that could be a fun thing to do. Um, and then lastly, while you're on the plat like, well, you're in the session and you're uh, listening to a talk, we're going to use this Q&A um, uh, tab, this Q&A feature to ask questions. So please don't use the chat or the raise hand uh, feature, but use only the Q&A button to uh, ask questions. And you'll see that in the box, you can pose a question or upvote, upvote other attendees' questions. And then the, the chair will relay those questions to the speakers. Uh, finally, I want to mention that we have uh, 10 uh, very interesting posters. You can find them uh, as you know PDFs in the uh, uh, bioconductor gateway of the F1000 research website, and there's going to be a EuroBio C2020 gateway area where you can check out the posters. But you can, you will like starting tomorrow after the during the the poster session, uh, there will be booths in the arena with the uh, with uh, the posters. And then, uh, last but not least, we have 12 wonderful workshops. And uh, you can, uh, you will see during the sessions, the workshop sessions, but we, you will be able to run workshops interactively in our studio, either in the cloud, thanks to this uh, uh, the fantastic work of Sean Davis and the orchestra app, 
or you can uh, run the Docker locally by downloading it from this page on our website, or you can just uh, follow along in your RStudio session. And uh, a lot of thanks to uh, Kevin Ruhalberg for the, um, you know, taking care of the organization of the workshop. So it was a, a lot of work. Uh, so I'm just going to stop here. I want to thank all my uh, co-organizers. This uh, was a lot of work to organize, uh, and you know, it's the first time I organized such a, a big event with 500 attendees. Um, but it was also a, a lot of fun to uh, interact with all these people. And so, uh, thanks to this uh, uh, wonderful um, uh, group of people, and also to Joe for the beautiful sticker that we have for this conference. Uh, so we have a full day ahead of us full of talks. And so uh, without uh, further ado, let me introduce uh, Martin Morgan, the uh, uh, project lead of the Bioconductor project. And uh, uh, Martin will give us some, um, you know, a, a state of the project address with uh, uh, where we are, where we're going with the Bioconductor project. So Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, Davide. It's really uh, wonderful to be here. I've been coming to BioC Europe uh, since 2006, I think. So uh, I've uh, almost almost 15 years, and I've been leading the Bioconductor project for uh, responsible for getting the packages on the website and the support site running and so on since about 2009. And uh, this is actually. I think my last uh, kind of formal obligation as uh, in that role, um, starting in March, Vince Carey will take primary responsibility for the project. So it's really wonderful to be um, able to talk to you uh, and BioC Europe uh, uh, this time. And it's great also to see so many familiar people, at least see in that kind of virtual way that we live in these days. Um, in the at the conference and also of course um, new faces and the participation is totally fantastic it's kind of like a, one of the surprising benefits of having it having our, our current situation is that you get to actually interact uh, with uh, lots more people um, and that's really wonderful so i'm going to share my screen i'll uh, just say a few uh, words about the project and where we stand i'll start with a big thanks like uh, the project just uh, is so amazingly uh, grateful to Davide and the other people on the organizing uh, committee. As I was walking into work this morning, I was thinking how risky it was to do this in a in a in a completely unfamiliar environment, and how maybe unexpected the workload uh, was because everything has to be reinvented from scratch. And they've done uh, just a tremendous job, and I'm really looking forward to the conference. Um, it's also really neat the way the conference facilitates participation from people um, locally and uh, globally. And, um, and of course, it also uh, enables people from uh, diverse parts of the world to come together. And I think that's so important in, in uh, this day and age. So uh, thank you all for attending. <clears throat> I'll say a few words about Bioconductor. Um, the, these will be sort of familiar at many levels, I'm sure, but um, perhaps there are uh, people who are new to the project um, just getting started, um, and this is uh, helpful, but it's also useful uh, if you've come to these uh, conferences over the years to remember um, uh, some of the, to, to, to watch as the project has grown and uh, become such a force in the bioinformatics community. The tagline for Bioconductor is uh, statistical analysis and comprehension of genomic data. There are uh, 1,974 R packages, software packages, that have been developed by the core team, but actually by more than 1,200 researchers globally. So it's a truly uh, community effort, and um, it's been hugely uh, successful. Um, there are more than three quarters of a million um, distinct IP downloads annually this year. Uh, that's an interesting uh, thing that'll come up. It's, uh, the project's been cited probably more than 42,000 times in PubMed Central, so that the project has had a huge scientific uh, impact, and that's through the contributions of uh, some of the people on this call, and perhaps uh, in the future from uh, your own contributions. The main places to access the project are our um, website in the background there, bioconductor.org, which provides introductory material. And then the support site, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is a great resource if you're having trouble with an analysis and trying to, trying to work through 
uh, using a package or understanding a, a, an analysis approach. And then especially as you become more established um, in, the, in the community, the, there's a Slack uh, channel, a community Slack channel that's become increasingly dynamic and exciting and a place for real um, innovation and a discussion of substantive uh, scientific issues. So I encourage you to par participate in the Slack. There's actually a link to the, to the Slack sign up on the, on the front page of the website. Uh, so who is it that actually uses Bioconductor? And I've uh, tried to highlight some of the key uh, topics that Bioconductor cover covers. Uh, single cell sequencing is incredibly important these days. And I've added a link here to the Orchestrating Single Cell Analysis resource, which is an amazing book about demonstrating all of the steps of single cell analysis and how it's performed in um, R and Bioconductor. There's also substantial uh, software for bulk RNA-seq differential expression, methylation, SNPs, expression arrays, and other um, even classic microarrays. And there's a pretty vibrant uh, and established meta metabolomics, proteomics, flow cytometry community, and additional uh, types of uh, resources. Um, I've just pulled out one package, spatial experiment, to illustrate the idea that um, this idea that people from uh, the broad community contribute to the project. So spatial experiment is contributed um, uh, over the last uh, release cycle by Dario Regali, who working with uh, Davide. And, um, and again, the uh, packages come from more than 1,200 international uh, uh, contributors. Um, and there are many fantastic packages that have originated in the European community. This is uh, package downloads from 2016 at the bottom to 2020 at the, at the top. You can see that the uh, um, user base has continued to grow each year. There's a diurnal cycle, so probably um, this represents academic activity. Uh, each of the academic terms, people taking time off in the summer and uh, at Christmas. Um, uh, and then uh, in uh, 2020, uh, this large increase here is when people went home and no longer had access to their um, installations at work and they took Bioconductor home with them. So somehow we've entered the homes of the of uh, people around the world, which is kind of amusing. Um, and then this is the a list of visitors to our uh, website uh, uh, ranked. The most visitors come from the United States and uh, number two, I think, is China. Uh, but then the um, European countries um, are really contributing. So there are very large communities of bioconductor users uh, throughout Europe. I wanted to say a few words about packages. We have a, every six months we have a new release. So release uh, 312 is the most recent release with the 1974 software packages, but also 968 annotation packages and 398 experiment data packages, 28 workflows, and two book length treatments. So I'd really encourage you to check out the books on bioconductor.org. They're a, a new feature and I think they're actually really, really um, compelling examples of how to use uh, software resources and to present them to the user community. There, we added 125 new software packages and the word cloud to the right demonstrates what those, uh, these are the BioC views terms from those uh, 125 uh, software packages so it gives you a sense of what uh, people are currently contributing to Bioconductor. Obviously, single cell transcriptomics, RNA-seq, uh, continuing in 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 interest in differential expression, quality control, clustering. Uh, we can see metabolomics, epigenetics, uh, particular statistical issues like batch effects and so on. Sorry, my mouse is really, um, really sensitive. Um, so, uh, so you get a sense of uh, what the uh, co contributions are of new packages. And as a project, it's been around for a long time and a, actually a major point about the project is to provide a platform for reproducible research. Um, so we actually have a number of packages that have been around since the beginning, since 2002 and 2000, 2003. But increasingly, we're also uh, removing packages that um, have uh, dependencies or base R changes that break the package and the maintainer and the community more generally is not update, able to update the code. And occasionally we also have maintainers who 
recognize that their software is no longer um, useful um, uh, and they're no longer in a position to maintain it. And uh, they ask that it be uh, deprecated. So usually we deprecate, uh, we try to deprecate packages in one release. So give you a heads up that the package is going away. And then in the next release, uh, the package is removed. Um, and I think uh, uh, packages being deprecated will be increasingly important uh, in the project. Mm. I know people are really interested in uh, contributing uh, to the project. And uh, creating a package is, of course, one way. That's at the bottom of the, this slide uh, for contributing. But there are many others. You can start, join, and participate in local user groups at your university, company, city, or globally. I, I actually had a kind of fun anecdote. I was invited to the Our Ladies Tunis um, Use Our um, Meetup, um, a virtual meetup. I'd never go to a meetup, you know, travel around the world to go to a, a hour and a half meetup um, in person, but I was happy to do it um, virtually. And I saw that the speaker before me was uh, Mike Love um, talking about differential expression using DEC2. And the speaker after me was Stephanie Hicks talking about ply ranges and genomic ranges. So these, um, this very local group had developed um, an, an international group of speakers coming in to talk with them. And in fact, the audience was international as well. So in many ways, the current situation provides an enormous opportunity for you to um, contribute, um, to pursue um, your interests and uh, enhance the experience of your local community, but with a global reach. It's really very exciting time. You can also contribute to the support site in Slack, answering questions you know about, and perhaps becoming a moderator to guide users to the best sources of support. Um, as you become more experienced with uh, Bioconductor, I'd really encourage you to participate in the developer forum and Slack in general. The developer forum is a monthly uh, Zoom session or um, conference session, video conference session, where a couple of topics interesting to package developers are um, discussed. And I also wanted to give a shout out to Kevin uh, Rue Albrecht's uh, BioC Challenges, um, which he'll talk about um, immediately after this. But also, I wanted to point this out as um, because it grew out of Kevin's interest to participate more in the project, or at least that's my interpretation. And it represents an effort that he's uh, spearheaded to um, uh, engage more with the project. So there are tons of ways to contribute. <clears throat> I wanted to say a few words about the core team, um, which is the group of people that I'm directly um, uh, responsible for. Um, we're funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Health, uh, various uh, federal U.S. federal grants, and by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, from left to right, we have uh, Kayla uh, Morel, um, Hervé Pages, Marcel Ramos, uh, Lori uh, Shepard, Nitesh uh, Taraga, and Jefe Wang, um, who are all doing interesting uh, activities in the core team. I'll just highlight a few of the things that the core team does. Uh, perhaps these are uh, familiar to, to you if you're, you've been in the project for, for a while. Um, one is we develop uh, standard data representations, such as the summarized experiment, which is illustrated on the right, and genomic ranges for working for, uh, with uh, genomic coordinates. And by having a st these standard data representations, it makes the packages in the bioconductor ecosystem interoperable, which is good for users, and maybe offsets a little bit the cost of learning to uh, manipulate these standard objects. And then the, the um, data representations are so heavily used that most of the edge cases of things behaving poorly or incorrectly have been identified. So the software is robust, and that's good for everybody. And then the um, core team is committed to long-term support of these data structures. So your work is likely to be reproducible into the future. So all of these uh, things motivate the use of standard data representations. We've also spent quite a bit of time developing infrastructure for working with large data, like the delayed array and HDF5 array and other backends. And the approach here is to keep as much of the data on disk as possible for as long as possible, while allowing for interactive exploration of subsets of the data and chunkwise processing of all of the data. So these are um, some primary activities of the core team. 
We've also been um, involved in um, trying to move some of our annotation resources, uh, like the org.hs.egdb, the BS genome packages, um, and other annotation resources, and also experiment data resources, which are used for illustrating uh, software. We've been trying to move those away from standard packages to uh, cloud-based resources um, in the form of Annotation Hub and Experiment Hub. And I was actually really surprised uh, looking uh, uh, a few, few weeks ago at how um, used these resources are. So over the past two weeks, there have been 1,730 uh, visitors to Annotation Hub, unique IP addresses, and 2,300 unique IP addresses uh, visiting Experiment Hub. And the, these hubs serve um, between five and 20,000 resources per day. So they're actually um, being used very heavily by the community. And if you're not familiar with uh, these uh, resources for, uh, say, uh, obtaining Johannes's Ensemble DB um, uh, reference objects, annotation objects, I'd totally encourage you to explore them. Um, we've also uh, been involved, in the core team, in developing containers. Uh, the containers that you use um, in the workshops uh, today that Sean Davis has built on, uh, an amazing uh, resource. You'll really enjoy the workshops. You'll have an amazing time using them. Uh, but also, in, uh, in general, I think bioinformatics is increasingly cloud-based, and containers are playing a central role in cloud-based computing efforts like the Anvil, uh, which I've also provided a link to. Uh, another activity of the core team that I just wanted to highlight is this package called BioCIO, which is a recent addition that um, uh, consolidates the use of an import generic and an export generic. And my hope is that Whenever someone writes a method to import or export to a standard file format, they'll use BioCIO and import and export so that our users will know that if they want to re use a, read a bed file, they'll use import um, and point it to the bed file and it will just work providing them with access to the standard data structures that I mentioned earlier. We're also involved in a lot of the behind the scenes activities of the nightly builds new package submission, and also management of um, releases, including package deprecation. I wanted to say just uh, in a, a few minutes here um, about the organization of the projects as it's, as it's grown. It used to be um, run, as I said, by me and the core team, mostly with consultation with a few key players. But we've tried to formalize uh, the way that this, the project is structured um, consolidating our long-term financial support through funding agencies and um, organizing the um, way that the uh, project is governed into a community advisory board and a technical advisory board. And of course, all of this is uh, facilitated by stickers, which are such an amazing uh, innovation. So the community advisory board is uh, responsible for training and outreach activities, as well as productive and re respectful participation of all. For instance, they're the group that's been responsible for development of the code of conduct. And you can see that it's a global, diverse group of uh, individuals contributing to the community advisory board. The technical advisory board is responsible for ensuring that the project remains technically relevant and that the core team tackles technically important um, challenges. And uh, it meets uh, monthly and again has representation from the, across the spectrum of the bioconductor uh, community. And I'll stop now with some formal acknowledgements. And I think there's an opportunity for questions if you, if you um, want to post them in the uh, Q&A spot of the, um, of the forum. Uh, it's been really great um, speaking with you today and leading the project um, uh, core team for the last uh, 10 or 11 years. Uh, so thanks very much. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. So um, if there are questions for Martin, we have, um, you know, maybe a couple of minutes for questions. Um, please post them in the Q&A box. And we also have a couple of hands raised. Yeah. So um, please, we are not going to use, uh, for the sake of time, the raised hand feature. But uh, if you somehow can summarize your question in the chat box, that would be great. We have the first question uh, from Laurent Gatto. 
Uh, what have been the major BioC innovations since Martin has been involved? Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, there's been a ton of infrastructure developed. So the the ranges infrastructure um, straddled the the time when I um, took um, a leadership role. The summarized experiment uh, has been um, developed under my uh, role. The hubs, the annotation and experiment hubs have been uh, developed. We've transitioned to the Docker images. Um, and then uh, also the structure of the uh, organization formalizing and making it more accessible with the community and technical advisory boards. So those are all things that have developed over the last um, uh, decade. The project's also seen like incredible growth um, in terms of uh, user base and, and, um, and uh, uh, particip participation, both of uh, packages and developers. Also, of course, science is like this traveling wave, right? Like topics that were hot uh, five years ago are, are now trailing. And it's really exciting to see the community track those. Sometimes we miss um, hot topics, but then uh, we also catch a few waves and uh, really propel the, the project forward. I think we were a little bit slow to the single cell world, but uh, the resources that have been developed now make uh, the software and bioconductor totally accessible and, and useful. All right, so um, there's another question by Mike Love. What do you think were the key aspects of the project early on that kept it relevant? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the, part of it is the, uh, you know, there's this phrase about uh, eating your own dog food so that if you produce software, you want to actually use it for in the analysis. And I think that that's the project has always had people such as Mike, <laughs> who uh, wrote software because they needed it. And then it's, um, I think that's really uh, essential. And then there's an element also of the support site, uh, the, originally the mailing list and, and now the support site and, and now Slack about um, participating in supporting the software that you, you produced. And maybe another component of the success of the project is only comes out in the long term, you know, that uh, you can still analyze your AFI arrays from uh, uh, 15 years ago in uh, Bioconductor, which is really amazing, um, but a uh, testament to the um, ability to write robust software that um, persists for a long period of time. So you have confidence that the software that you're using as a user, you know, you're going to use software that's going to be supported, it's going to work, and it's going to be around when you come back to your project six months from now. And uh, perhaps the last quick question, uh, which is um, by Sira Ramirez. I hope I didn't kill your name. Um, uh, are there plans for a package to transform the most popular objects to improve compatibility between packages, or is this up to the community? Uh, there are kind of two, two uh, components to that. One is, um, you know, when people submit a package, they'll often submit, so a, a new package comes to Bioconductor, they'll sometimes use data structures that aren't, say, summarized experiment based. They'll use like a plain old matrix. So during the review process, we do try and corral uh, the co contributions towards these standard data representations. And often that's very useful. And often uh, the maintainer is initially reluctant to do so, then realizes that it's fairly straightforward. So within the project, we're doing that. Um, there's also sort of a, a I'd say tension uh, between what the project does and what um, what people outside the project, say Surat or in the Python community, are, are doing, and uh, um, there's a tension for uh, uh, providing an easy interface or an easy path from, say, a Surat data object to an, a single cell experiment object. And it's a, it's a very challenging thing to do in the long term because we can't actually control what the Surat, believe it or not, the Surat people do with their data objects. And it's a, a, a tough... Um, we uh, tried. <laughs> <laughs> a tough thing uh, to do. Like conceptually, the data objects are very similar. And so you'd think uh, that it was possible. Um, so I think that's an ongoing community effort to figure out how to make other people outside the community, make it easy to interoperate with their software. Okay, so um, thank you, Martin. Thank you so much for uh, for your review. And um, I think next up, we have a pre-recorded talk um, uh, by Kevin uh, Ruhalbrecht, who is a computational biologist at the University of Oxford. 
and um, you know uh, interested in in uh, computational biology in general and software engineering best practices in particular and um, uh, I think we will uh, hear about the bio C challenges something that uh, you know could be interesting to um, look at throughout the conference I think you can hear me and you can see Kevin right now as well, but we also have a kind of a backup plan, which is our primary plan now, and I'm going to start playing the video that Kevin put together. Welcome, everyone. It's a great honor for me to follow on Martin's opening remarks and to introduce this initiative on behalf of the European Bioconductor 2020 Organizing Committee. In this presentation, I will introduce BioC Challenges, a platform intended to host challenges contributed and collaboratively tackled by the Biconductor community. As a matter of introduction, I think most of you will agree with me that one of the most appealing features of the Biconductor community, aside from the high quality software, is the friendly and supportive community spirit that exists throughout the project. There isn't a single day that goes by during week and weekend without messages on the Slack channel, the support site, or individual GitHub repositories where a question posted by a community member is almost instantly replied to and resolved by a fellow community member. In particular, I also don't need to explain the benefits of collaborative work, both local and external. Collaborations draw their strength from being more than the sum of their parts, with the combined expertise of collaborators often essential to overcome issues that would take individuals infinitely longer to resolve. There are invaluable benefits in openly discussing ideas before and all the way through a project to identify and anticipate issues as early as possible and avoid investing time in dead ends or reinventing any wheel. I have personally learned so much from the way others work, in particular integrating my practices in the group where I have worked with those of external collaborators how to set up and manage projects involving local and external collaborators who don't necessarily have the same setup. I have also learned a lot of transferable skills and best practices that have improved my working habits. Those include best practices in the use of Git, unit testing, and continuous integration, continuous delivery. And finally, trying things and asking questions have often bro broken the ice with more experienced members of the community who helped me develop skills and knowledge that I have myself passed on to others. To give you an idea of what a challenge could look like and how they could come to life, I want to illustrate the concept with a real story that took place once upon a time at a EuroBioC conference. Four postdocs sat together at a break. Single cell genomics had been on the rise for a while then, and there had been a special interest group about that that brought those postdocs together. So the conversation kept going with one of the postdocs wishing there was an interactive shiny app to have all those typical plots just to click away for us and for our collaborators. Some of the other postdocs bragged about all the fun they'd had writing shiny apps. At which point, one of them opened their laptop and said, all right, hang on, let's create a GitHub repository and dump our wish list of functionality in the readme. While another opened their laptop and went, I'll make a new channel in the Bioconductor Slack to keep the conversation going. And by the end of the conference, the scaffold of a new package was born. Four months later, the package renamed IC was accepted by a conductor. I've linked the GitHub commit where you can find the initial readme with the original wish list to give you an idea. Anyway, enough with the, the nostalgia. What BioC Challenges is, is a public platform for the Bioconductor community to announce and contribute to bite-sized projects beneficial to the, to the community at all levels. My personal hope being that it could help replicate the kind of magic that, that led to the conception of IC but I am also very much looking forward to original ideas contributing to the community in their own ways. I have many ideas, but I want this platform to belong to the community, not to any one person. Thanks to Laurent Gato's suggestion, BioC Challenges is implemented as an R package, which passes BioC checks, so I'd be happy to submit it as a Bioconductor package. In that package, each vignette, is stored, uh, each vignette stored in the vignette slash challenges subdirectory represents a challenge. The GitHub repository is public and anyone can add a challenge by submitting a pull request. The BIOC challenge repository is only meant to contain the challenges, the challenge proposals, not their implementation. Contributions addressing the challenges should be created as separate GitHub repositories, which will then be listed on the challenge page so that prospective challenge contributors can be aware of existing contributions 
and decide, with, and decide whether they wish to contribute to those existing repositories or start their own. Each challenge must, must have at least one volunteer leader. Typically, that would be the person adding the challenge, although perhaps they can arrange with someone more experienced on the subject to take the lead with their consent. Challenge leaders should be willing to volunteer some of their time to clarify aspects of the challenge if prospective contributors have questions. Ideally, they would also be willing to present the challenge and its progress at bioconductor events, including birds of a feather discussions or maybe even workshops. On a slightly more sobering note, I would also take a minute to indicate what BIOC challenges is not. In particular, challenges are intended to benefit the community, not one particular individual. For instance, please do not add challenges that happen to be exercises for exams or your PhD project. Also, please make sure that your challenge does not create conflicts of interest with unpublished work in your group. Check with your group leader if you have any doubt. Instead, think about those small things that could make life easier for you and your fellow community members. New S4 classes to store particular data modalities, helper functions to wrap common tasks, or new pre-processed data sets available for, to use in package vignettes and benchmarking. Finally, here's a preview of the BioC Challenges website compiled using PackageDown. The README produces this landing page, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge Johannes Heiner for his limitless sticker skills, kindly illustrating the notion that there is safety in numbers when it comes to tackling challenges. The navigation bar at the top leads to the, to the individual challenges under the Articles tab. And all challenge pages are built from a common template and look like this. Without going too much into detail, the template is a parameterized markdown, where information about each challenge is given as parameters in the YAML header used to populate the various sections of the challenge vignette. The guideline section is the only freeform section of the vignette that challenge leaders can use to provide any kind of detail about the challenges remit. Dicey Challenges in its in, is its in early days, and we look very much forward to your feedback about its format and functionality. Finally, coming to how you may contribute to BIOC challenges this week and beyond, I would encourage you to consider generating ideas and taking actions contributing to the challenges. First, check out the existing challenges available at that link. Then, very much like my experience with IC, with the difficulties of online confer conferencing, I encourage you to network with conference participants and speakers, making use of the AirMeet conference platform, including a booth in the arena dedicated to spontaneous discussion between BIOC challenges participants. You may also want to use the appropriate channels in the Bioconductor Slack workspace to discuss certain topics and potentially involve like-minded community members subscribed to those channels. Then, once you have a suitable ID and a challenge leader, do fork the Biosy Challenges GitHub repository, add your own challenge vignette, and submit a pull request. Conversely, if you see an existing challenge that you wish to contribute to, Create your GitHub repository, add it to the list on the page of that challenge, which will also involve a pull request to the BIOC Challenges repository. And finally, do notify me throughout the week as I will give a closing presentation on Friday, reporting any development that will have taken place during the week. And with that, I am happy to take any questions you may have. All right, thanks, Kevin. Um, I think in the interest of time, actually, um, uh, you can uh, perhaps meet Kevin at the at the BioC Challenges booth, uh, or you know, with direct chat messages and and sort of uh, uh, talk offline, so that we we can avoid uh, being super late already at the first session of the week. <laughs> um, but yeah, I very much look forward to the final presentation where all these ideas will will be presented. And and just to reiterate what Kevin has said, um, the Aramid platform is open. 24-7 throughout this week. So uh, if you want to meet at the tables in the mornings, um, even when there are no sessions, you can do that. Um, so please take advantage of this um, if you want. All right, so uh, for our next uh, speaker, I'm uh, thrilled to introduce our first uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Holger Hein. Um, Holger is the head, uh, or actually the team leader of the single cell genomics group at the National Center for Genomic Analysis in Barcelona. And he was telling me earlier that it's a beautiful day in Barcelona, so we're all angry over him. I won't lie, I won't lie. 
so uh, recently, uh, Holger has focused on uh, the application of the latest single cell and spatial transcriptomics uh, technologies to uh, both tackle uh, basic research questions and translational research questions. He's very much involved with the human cell atlas and uh, with, uh, you know, um, immuno-oncology and, and other uh, very exciting uh, uh, developments of transcriptomics. And so uh, I, I believe that today he's going to talk about um, okay. how to build a tumor uh, atlas for uh, immuno-oncology. So I, I'm really <coughs> looking forward for, for his talk. I'll try my best. Just a heads up, I'm not a computation biologist, so all slides are related to experimental design, benchmarking of protocols, or application in the immunology context, but I hope I can still keep you entertained in the next half an hour or so. 30 minutes, right? 35 minutes, yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to give an experimental talk to this computational audience. <laughs> Uh, but I think in the end, it's the, the, the synergy of, of both communities that make that makes experiment successful and, and projects uh, kind of um, yeah, as successful to, to the very end, from from experimental design to to data interpretation and later ideally applications in a in a research or clinical context. So with the first slide, I would like to summarize the way we do science here at the lab. So one, one can describe it as technology-driven research, where always with the focus uh, on my group on, on single-cell genomics applications, we kind of scout for new technologies that are upcoming. Starting five years ago with single-cell RNA sequencing, now over, over the years kind of advancing RNA sequencing to, to more than hundreds of cells, but thousands of cells. And um, with the years implementing different uh, modalities such as DNA sequencing, attack now in combination with a TCR or PCR sequencing and recently starting probably the end of last year with a spatial transcriptomics applications. Uh, so but um, the, the cycle of kind of implementing technologies and applying those in our research context is not not direct. So we go through several like refinement steps where we benchmark technologies, where um, we find standards for sampling. If not available, we, we kind of develop new by um, computational tools. Um, to allow like a meaningful and kind of robust data data interpretation, and then eventually we scale those technologies to a format where we can use them at large scale and cost efficiently, uh, especially for for larger projects um, like our work in the Human Cell Atlas project, where we are responsible for the atlas of the B cell lineage. At the moment, uh, heavily working on the tonsil atlas, and uh, hope to have something out beginning of next year. But we also uh, um, kind of are involved in, in the pancreas atlas project and the, the kidney atlas project. In the clinical context, which will be the major focus of my talk today, we work on oncology with a uh, specialty in immunotherapy and with a vision to bring kind of latest technologies into a digital pathology, pathology format uh, that allows kind of the assessment of, of thousands of features to predict immunotherapy outcomes. Um, so eventually new technologies are coming up and then they again go through this cycle of, of, of refinement, benchmarking and, and, and scaling. Okay. Um, I'm aware that not everyone uh, is or has been working with single cell technologies. Um, so just a quick uh, introduction into how data is generated, uh, sequenced and kind of uh, the, the first step of data processing and data analysis. So ideally, we would start with cells that are already in solutions like PBMCs, so that would make our life easier. But in the most most of the context, we work uh, or we start with a solid tissue that needs to be digested, mostly with mechanic and enzymatic forces, towards a single cell solution that is then be filtered, and can be moved to the to the capture formats that we have in in the in the sample processing step uh, number two. Um, the the first sample preparation part is the most Kind of uh, uh, the phase most prone to technical artifacts, where stress signatures can be induced, or we can lose cell types on the way by damaging them through the mechanistic or enzymatic forces. Uh, some cell, type, cell types are very hard to dissociate, it, so we kind of bias our single cell solution to, uh, against them. Um, so this is the most critical step that needs to be controlled very well in the experimental design. 
Then in the second step, we would capture single tel cells in individual capture formats. This can be plates, droplets, nanowells. Um, uh, ideally, we would, we would uh, integrate a single cell index very early in this library preparation post process that would then allow pooling molecules together and work on pools, which is more, much more cost efficient than working on, on single cell formats uh, to, to, to later stages in the process. And then one after sequencing, libraries are of ASCII files are mapped uh, to, to, to kind of map to the reference genomes, quantified to end up with the uh, with a large matrix where we have cells and, and genes, and, and these count matrix is then uh, input for the downstream data processing, which kind of uh, kind of scaled a lot over the last years by having I don't know how many hundreds of tools, how many hundreds of tools uh, out there to allow kind of a meaningful and, and, and like. Um, uh, creative data analysis. Um, the same as for many genomics applications. So whenever we start with a sub-optimal sub or not ideal uh, starting material, um, um, we follow this rubbish in, rubbish out uh, scenario where we have uh, kind of a lot of biases, technical problems in the very beginning that again, that would allow us to cluster cells and to dif identify different, different genes. But what we would measure were uh, would be basically technical artifacts and not the, the real biology that we would uh, want to uh, elucidate, elucidate in our samples. So here again, the, this first part is, is, uh, is essential and, and crucial for a meaningful and, and robust data interpretation afterwards. And within the human cell artists grow, uh, within the human cell artists project, um, we have started a standards and technology working group which I'm co-leading with uh, Joey Sang and Orit Rosen Rosenblatt, uh, where we kind of scout new technologies coming up that might, might be interesting for the human cell letters community, but also the broader uh, senior cell genomics community. Uh, then we would benchmark those um, against existing technologies, uh, identify standards, standard operating procedures, eventually scale those to formats that are appropriate for single cell atlas projects and then disseminate protocols to the, to the single cell or to the human cell atlas and broader single cell community. Uh, it kind of all started years ago with an effort spearheaded by, by Christoph Siegenhain and published in Molecular Cell, I think in 2017, where we benchmark uh, the back then existing single cell RNA sequencing methods um, uh, using like a, a homogeneous set of uh, mouse embryonic uh, stem cells, back then SmartSeq2 was the winner, but this was like uh, four years, well, three years ago from now. And we followed up, followed up on this effort by benchmarking uh, now in 2020, or the effort was more um, towards 2019, um, existing technologies, uh, around 20 of them, in two um, complementary benchmarking efforts where we coordinated, coordinated an effort where we sent a reference sample out in a multi-center studies to, uh, to partnering labs to run their uh, single cell protocols on site. And a complementary effort headed by <coughs> Joshua Levin and head of, uh, head of, uh, head of, uh, of lab-centric um, design where uh, all um, single cell RNA sequences implemented in their labs were run on a single sample, uh, but on site and not distributed across multiple centers. And this is kind of the, the outcome of, of our work. It's published this year in Nature Biotech, so I will not go very much into detail. The reference sample included mouse and human um, cells, blood and, and colon cells, to kind, of have, to kind of have an overview of how the masses perform in different uh, tissue contexts, but also with different sizes and RNA contexts of, of single cells. And then we kind of, for the analysis stratified uh, methods or all the data sets by, by species and then cell types, and to get an overview of how these methods behave. And we ended up with a, with a ranking uh, and a benchmarking score of, of these methods. But I believe Isabetta was presenting uh, the results last year. So I will just uh, leave you with a summary that quartz 2 was an excellent method, uh, capturing uh, a good proportion of the transcriptome, the plate-based method developed by the Ricken. Um, but also on the, already on the second and third place with chromium and smart 2 uh, the to date, I guess, mostly used methods in, in labs worldwide. Then in a, in a second benchmarking effort, <coughs> sorry, 
we were wondering how the sample preparation itself would impact on the on a single cell transcriptome profile. And as we were moving towards the clinical context and into larger clinical cohorts, uh, PVMC, so peripheral blood monotonic cells, are mainly collected from patients during the mornings and then often processed only in the afternoon. So we have a like an, uh, time difference between sample um, sample extraction and sample preparation. Uh, during this time, samples are left at room temperature or even uh, shipped at room temperature to different centers overnight, uh, which can also take uh, up to two days. Um, uh, for um, for uh, for example, in in biobanking in biobanking scenarios, we were wondering if how this impacts on a single cell transcriptome. Uh, which would then challenge downstream analysis. So this is summarized here, also published in Genome Biology this year. I will walk through it quickly. So in gray, you have single cells cryopreserved immediately. And then with the color gradients, you see uh, single cells cryopreserved after 2, 8, 24, or 84 hours. And you see an immense shift of the expression profile uh, while time is, time is progressing. Uh, we could trace this back to a reduction of overall expression uh, activity within the cells over time, but also to a, a quite specific cold shock signature uh, that involved many genes uh, related to the to the um, kind of uh, temperature effect that we introduced when, say, when taking samples out from from a 37 degrees environment. Uh, we were um, presenting solutions to get rid of the signature one. The first would be the computation correction, which worked pretty well. Uh, we could also take cells into culture again, culture them for 24 hours, which kind of normalize this cold shock and uh, um, overall alterations in the gene expression profile. And the third solution, and kind of uh, very straightforward to implement in the clinical context, is to, to store sample just on ice. So after sample extraction, if you saw, store blood in the fridge or on ice, the, the thing is that transcriptome profiles are conserved for up to, up to two days. Okay. And all of these benchmarking efforts are now summarized in a, in a publication which comes out hope, hopefully this month or uh, latest next month in, in the Nature Biotech, where we kind of summarize benchmarking efforts in the Human Cell Atlas uh, project uh, based on sample collection or different prof, uh, protocols or profiling technologies <coughs> suggesting decision trees and ideally the dissemination of protocols to the general public through SOPs, trainings, guidelines, various standards, uh, lab exchanges, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, this was just a quick introduction for this for a technical benchmarking part, but the main talk uh, we focus on the or on, on our activities to generate reference atlases of healthy and diseased tissues. Uh, today, I will not focus on the on the B cell uh, um, um, B cell atlas projects, neither on the kidney or, or pancreas atlas, but go straight to the to the disease context. And here, focusing on the <coughs> on an effort that where we generate an atlas of the human immune cell microenvironment. Okay, this is work led by by Paula Neto and she kind of collected uh, um, single cell data sets from, from very different uh, studies, different cancer types, more than 200 patients, a total of more than 500,000 cells, and merged those in a, in a, in a tumor immune cell atlas reference. Okay, and this is how the, the reference looked like. So after, after filtering and uh, extraction on, on only immune cells from all of these data sets, uh, we could cluster immune cells to 25 different clusters. Um, these clusters kind of represent the um, the biology that you would expect uh, for immune cells in a tumor mark environment. So we probably could have clustered deeper, but these are the cell states or cell types and states that people uh, kind of is expect in a microenvironment. And we use these later as reference to do spatial mapping, to do uh, patient stratification. So we kind of left it here um, with cell states that have been previously described. And you might see my, my cursor. So on the on the top, we see plasma B cells. At the bottom, we see general B cells. On the, on the right-hand side, we, we see more uh, myelite clusters. But on the top, we have macrophages. On the bottom, we have dendritic cells, uh, some proliferating macrophages. Um, but the major proportion of, of tumor in, invading immune cells uh, related to, uh, to, to a T cell, uh, to a T cell compartment here on the left side. 
And here we identified 12 different T-cell states with more abundant or more rare states, um, and from, from very naive to very differentiated. So here in pink, we see naive cells, and then when you walk through the colors and more to the right, cells are getting more memory-like or transitional activated, ending up with being on the top, top, uh, top right blue here, uh, being fully exhausted, but we also, um, we also identify pre-exhausted cell states. On the top, we have prolif proliferating T cells, and, and this is, is basically the, the, the cell types that um, form a tumor microenvironment as we detected them so on the next slide across most of the patients. So most of these clusters were represented by, by more than 100 patients and we de detected them in most of the cancer types. So this is kind of the universal references of immune cell states that are uh, co-localized with, uh, with the tumors in general. Um, this annotation was done by, by kind of hand curating uh, signatures by looking at markers that had been previously described, involving or hiring and involving an immunologist that looked at marker sets one by one. We curated signatures that had been uh, published in the, in the past. We are quite confident that this annotation is very close to close to reality and can serve as reference uh, for the general community. So all these ATLAS data sets are published, the papers published in, in BioArchive code in GitHub, a uh, data set at Zenodo for R and R in Python format. So I uh, feel free to use it and uh, happy, to get your, happy to get your feedback. Uh, what we've done in terms of application with this Atlas was, first of all, stratification of patients based on the immune cell profile. So here we clustered, um, um, we clustered patients based on their frequency of immune cells present in their tumor microenvironment, environment. And we've seen six major clusters uh, with their very different uh, immune cell infiltration profiles. So moving for, from uh, left to right, uh, the first cluster was represented by a high abundance of recently activated T cells, uh, CD4 T cells and naive memory CD4 cells. And then the second cluster was a more inflamed cytotoxic, cytotoxic cluster with cytotoxic CD8 cells and permanent exhausted CD8 cells. Uh, the third cluster is a myelar cluster with a high infiltration of M2 human filtrating or tumor associated macrophages and SP, SPP1 terms. Then we had a smaller cluster enriched in plasma B cells, uh, cluster enriched in TH17 T cells, and finally the, 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 the brown cluster here, um, patients enriched with a high frequency of, of B cells. Um, so, on what we are, so after this immune based uh, patient stratification, we now move ahead to kind of um, like move in clinical features by using new external data sets and then the classifier to enrich our, our immune subtypes with the clinical with clinical associations uh, with the final um, idea to um, to use this classification to predict uh, patient prognosis or mainly um, also immunotherapy. Okay, in a, in a second application scenario, we used the ATLAS as reference for an automated uh, annotation system. Here we used uh, surrogate based uh, layer label transfer and cell by cell mapping to, to, uh, to uh, after generating our own single cell data sets and mapping those uh, to, to the reference ATLAS. Um, on top, you see an ovarian cancer case where uh, in the top left, um, you see uh, myeloid cells, different populations of macrophages. Um, the, the embedding is, comes from the transcriptome of, of the newly generated Kiri data sets, and the color code comes from the label transfer to the, to the reference atlas. So this can be done cell by cell level, but on the right, you see that also on cluster level, here we use match score two to uh, match um, clusters of the Kiri data sets to the, to the, to the atlas reference. On the on the bottom, you see more examples. Two on the on the left, um, uveal melanomas uh, or uveal melanoma metastasis to the liver, uh, where you see, for example, here in the middle, you see different uh, T cell states with a naive uh, in, in pink and a cytotoxic fraction in, in the middle, proliferating on the left, and uh, some I think these are uh, recently activated in light blue. If you compare this to a second case. Uh, which is kind of facilitated by this automation annotation scenario, you see that you still have a fraction of cytotoxic cells, but you have some enrichment of thermally exhausted cells 
uh, suggesting that this tumor is a different immune cell state uh, compared to this. Okay, so this is the, the second application scenario that we envision for the atlas. And the third uh, is based on the integration into spatial transcriptomics data sets. And now I'm coming to the major focus of the talk where we generated spatial transcriptomics data sets for, uh, for tumor sections and mapped our immune cell states into, into the sections to identify, kind of to quantify, um, to quantify abundance and to um, identify localization differences between uh, tumor sections and how immune cells are localized in respect to tumor cells. With the final idea to, to use these uh, um, uh, quantification and spatial localization as input to predict immunotherapy outcome as tumors that have more infiltrating uh, cytotoxic or activated T cell states are suggested to be uh, more uh, susceptible to, to immunotherapy outcome. Okay, the a standard application would be to look at these spots. Okay, let me quickly just introduce you to the spatial transcriptomics technology because some of you might not be aware. Uh, with which uh, how is the data format here? So in this case, we kind of exchange the single cell barcode uh, for a, for a coordinate barcode. So on these uh, microarrays, we have uh, we have spots, and these spots are capture oligos uh, to capture um, a, a messenger RNA from sections that we mount on the top. So after permeabilization, RNA will be captured on the spots, and each spot has a specific barcode that later after pooling and sequencing would kind of um, relate the, the FASTQ file to a specific coordinate on the section, and in our case, then a coordinate in the, in the tumor cell. <clears throat> so here we can work on, on the expression profile, so each spot would give us a merged uh, expression profile. Uh, in this case, so we work on the, on the Vision platform where the dots are 55 microns, and um, with this, we would capture up to 10 cells, so what we would measure is a the merged transcriptome profile of the sections mounted on top. And we were envisioning that it's much more precise using a reference and then a spot-based spot deconvolution to, to identify spatial pat pat patterns of immune cells and to better quantify, quantify abundance. So here, uh, Mark Elusua from my lab developed a, a tool called Spotlight uh, based on a seeded NMF regression to deconvolute spatial Transcriptomics data as an input. You have in our case the the tumor cell, tumor immune cell atlas, uh, the single cell data sets in the 25 states. These, these are converted to topic profiles, and uh, for the single uh, for the spatial transcriptomics data set, uh, we kind of use then these topic profiles to deconvolute each spot to predict a presence of immune cells within the spot, and we end up with a deconvolution and a prediction of composition per spot. Okay, so this is the theory, and this is how it looks like in practice. So in this case, we looked at uh, oropharyngeal uh, carcinoma. The, on the left, you see an HE staining, which is basically staining the, the, the major fraction or major architecture of the tumor. And then on the left, uh, on the right, you see um, um, already kind of clustered spatial transcriptomics data. In this case, the spots are clustered by similarity of their merged transcriptome. A profile of, of the of the mixture of cells that you have captured per spot, and this is um, helpful to identify the major architects or major structure of a tumor. Where in this case, in the, the greenish colors, you have the tumor area, and red, you have the stromer, the surrounding tumor cells or cells surround, surrounding the, the tumor area. Then here we identified like a purple a purple cluster related to enrichment of immune cells. I will, talk, I will tell you later what that is. Um, but here we, we then integrated our single cell uh, tumor immune cell atlas using Spotlight with a spatial transcriptomic section, and we end up with a deconvolution or with a prediction of immune cell states per uh, per spot. It can kind of uh, display this in, in pie charts per spot, where the pie charts then um, uh, highlights the, the the proportion of immune cells that are predicted to be or that in, in the tumor mounted on, mounted on top. And if you look at the section as a whole, you see different degrees of colors or different proportions of colors that kind of coincide with the cancer and stroma area. And if you then zoom in, you see that there are specific cell types enriched in the tumor area, uh, 
uh, in, res or in comparison to specific or to other cell types that are enriched in this tumor or the immune cell enriched proportion on the, on the bottom on the bottom left. Zooming into these, these pie charts, you kind of get an, an, a representation, an overview of the immune cells that we detect uh, per spot. And then you clearly see like a spatial or differentially spatial distribution of these 25 immune cell states across the tumor sections. So on top, on the top left, or moving from, from left to right, we see this small lymphoid structure that we had on the, on the bottom left. It's, it's full of B cells and, and proliferating B cells. And if you go to the cancer sections, you see within the cancer enrichment of proliferating um, the T cells, while the stromer section is uh, in, uh, enriched in a more like immunosuppressive environment, um, dominated by regulatory T cells, M2 TAMs, SPP, SPP1 TAMs, and terminally exhausted uh, CD8 cells. And if you then zoom into uh, like specific cell types, you see kind of a mutually exclusive patterns where you have proliferating T cells within the cancer area and terminally exhausted. So those T cells that had been active in the past but were forced to be um, <clears throat> inactive located in this tumor area in a kind of mutually exclusive pattern to the proliferating T cells. Um, so having a kind of prediction of immune cells per spot, we can use this then to, to um, um, to, to ask for a, for a significant or enrichment in, in the different areas that we have tended, that we have identified. So this is what you see here in the middle. We see the proliferative T cells enriched in the, in the tumor sections, while we have M2 TAMs clearly enriched in the stromal part, the B cells enriched in the, in the lymphoid structure. And we see also, for example, the naive memory uh, T cells enriched more in one tumor section compared to the other. But I have a, much better example for, for kind of cancer clone enrichment in, a, in the next slide. Um, with this, we can also kind of could compute a, a co-localization matrix where we see which immune cell types are co-localized um, in this section. Uh, here we see that proliferating um, B cells are co-localized co with recent, uh, no, sorry, proliferating T cells are localized with uh, recently activated C CD4 T cells. And on top, we see all this co-localization of the, the immunosuppressive environment, and in the middle, the small structure of uh, co-localized B cells and proliferating B cells. Okay, this is one section we now looked at many. Uh, from those, I would highlight one one more example where we looked especially on uh, um, we looked like we, look, <coughs> we looked on uh, um, heterogeneity within the cancer area, so comparing. Stromer and, and tumor is, is one application scenario, but obviously you want to cover enough proportion of a tumor, you will see a, a cancer, cancer cell-based uh, heterogeneity. And this is what we are highlighting here. Um, so this is a breast carcinoma uh, with the tumor section, or most of the tumor sections uh, here on the, on the middle, middle, middle left part. Uh, if you cluster the, uh, the, the spots just based on the transcriptome, you see that there are different like cancer uh, or tumor areas um, highlighted by different uh, different transcriptomes. And we, when we look deeper, we, we see like two different driver genes enriched in two or in these different areas uh, with the estrogen receptor and HER2 um, being uh, kind of mutually exclusive in this cancer in this cancer area. And we were wondering how this relates to a different uh, immune cell infiltration and the, in the different putative cancer clones. So we again uh, um, applied spotlight to deconvolute uh, spots and predict immune cell proportions. And you see already uh, looking at the, the, at the bottom left part that you have different uh, co-localization, different proportions of immune cells infiltrating the HER2 or the ER2 positive uh, cancer areas with the transitional memory cells more co-localized to the bottom and uh, pre-exhausted CD8 cells in the in the HER2 positive area. Okay, again, this is kind of uh, uh, zooming into cell types uh, one by one. And here we see that the, the lower part of the, of the cancer area is, is highly enriched in proliferative T cells, while we have a mutually exclusive pattern with pre exhausted CD8 cells, um, um, also co localizing with the anti inflammatory and M2 TAMPs. 
And I think a nice example here on the right right hand part is you see the, the cancer area kind of uh, being evaded by, by plasma T cells, where the uh, plasma B cells, sorry, where the B cells uh, are flanking the, the tumor areas uh, being uh, localized at the, at the border between a stroma and, and, and a tumor or a tumor clone area. Okay, with this, check the time. I think I have time for one more example. So in this case, we looked as part of our tonsil atlas, we looked at the, the spatial transcriptomic slide of a tonsil. Again, we applied spotlight. In this case, we use as reference not our tumor immune cell atlas, but we use the tonsil atlas, which are at the moment around 300,000 cells. So we have a very fine-grained overview, but I've shown you, I only show you here the, the, the level one annotations where we just broadly annotated major cell types. And then we look at the distribution of those cell types across our, uh, across our tonsil areas. And you nicely see a structure which is called germinal center, where you have an enrichment of B cells on the, on the bottom, bottom right. And these germinal centers are kind of flanked by a T cell zone with enrichment of CD4, uh, CD4 T cells. And you have an epithelial area uh, of kind of flanking uh, the entire section. And you have naive and memory B cells in the part uh, adjacent to the, to the German centers. So I think with these three, ex three examples, I hope I could convince you that uh, this proportional al analysis is very, very helpful for the interpretation, not only for uh, the tumor oncology, uh, for the tumor oncology field, but also for atlasing projects uh, showcased here by, the, by our activities in the tonsil atlas. Uh, with this, I would wrap up. And I hope I convinced you that 10 x is smart seek. So these broadly used methods are, are, are suitable to generate high resolution uh, single cell RNA seq profiles. Um, but be careful with the with the experiment, experimental design because uh, their technical artifacts can be um, in, uh, can be included at the very beginning of, of the design when when samples are taken. So this has to be controlled very well. And in the, in the main part of the talk, I, I showed you how we generated a tumor immune cell atlas and how this can be applied for patient stratification based on the immune cell infiltration as an automated tool for annotation and also to map immune cells in tumor sections in, in space. And with this, I would like to thank my, my wonderful team. So this was really a team effort uh, with data today uh, shown uh, mainly produced by, by Paula Nieto, Mark Sewer, interpretation by, uh, done by our immunologist, Juan Nieto. And yeah, thanks to, to all of my team and my funding agencies, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you so much, Holger. It was an amazing, <laughs> amazing talk. Uh, so I know it can be uh, frustrating to talk in an empty room, but uh, I, was, uh, I was very... Uh, I uh, taken by your by your talk, so uh, I think we already have some questions. But uh, uh, since I'm the chair, I'm going to take that uh, you know as a as a privilege to ask the first one. And I mean, it seems that these are really beautiful data sets. I think you know the spatial transcriptomics is really a game changer in in not only in cancer but especially in cancer, right? And so I was wondering, uh, um, you know, what how how do you see this uh, as a future tool, like? How, how much do you think it's uh, before we can see it in, in the clinic, uh, Ewan? I think, I think the, the technology is already there. So this uh, spatial transcriptomics, Visium, uh, SlideSeq, it's a very defined format with a kind of informative enough output. So you can recognize major areas. So the way that pathologists now would look at a slide, these are areas, shapes, architectures that you would recognize just based on clustering the, 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 the transcriptome profile, then being more like advanced and deconvoluting spots to immune cell or stroma or, or cancer cell states, obviously opens a completely new box, right? So we can look at many more features, not only at shape or structure, but we look at 20,000 like transcriptome or entire transcriptome plus whatever modality you to put on top. I think this is definitely uh, there already in terms of technology. Now we have to wrap this up in a, in a format that is easy to interpret and obviously link clinical features. I think it's a major, major step now and we work on larger co cohorts taken in clinical trials that would hopefully allow us to kind of 
kind of associate a structure and composition to a clinical outcome. And here we focus on immunotherapy, but I think this can be applied for many therapies. Yeah, yeah, no, this is really exciting. Um, so we have, uh, well, I'll start with the most upvoted question is uh, from Mark Robinson at uh, University of Zurich. Um, nice talk. Uh, given your focus on benchmarking, have you compared spatial platforms, uh, Cartana, Visium, SlideSeq2? Uh, if so, any early si uh, insights into relative strengths? No. After the RNA seq, we, I thought about stopping benchmarking at all. But then we went on benchmarking the ATAC-seq technology. Spatial, we didn't start. Obviously, there's a Space TX project, which is kind of going this direction. So they have different protocols being applied on consecutive slides. So for sure, they will include also latest spatial transcriptomic methods. Uh, we are very happy with the spatial transcriptomics because it's a very kind of defined output. So you work on spots. And you kind of, once you can decode spots or, or cluster spots, this is a very nice, uh, like consistent output that can be used for downstream applications. And I think that makes it easier to implement also in the clinical context. But yeah, yeah the question, I have no, no. So there's room for Mark to <laughs> no benchmark. A benchmark. <laughs> so the next upvoted question is, uh, can, could you please comment on the naive memory CD4 T cell population? Which part of T cell differentiation do they belong to? I think this refers to the Atlas uh, part. Yeah. So then, what we identified 12 different T cell states, and they kind of um, represent the progression of an activation of, of na naive T cells. They naive, what was the question? Naive memory. So they're different uh, like states when uh, uh, T cells get effector, effector cells, and then either. Um, um, Kind of keep kind of directly kill cancer cells or attack cancer cells or keep the memory and activate other T cell states or, or other immune cell related uh, cell types. So yeah, um, so to to make a long story short, it's uh, um, it's 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 kind of the what we address is like the the knowledge that had been developed over the last years on tumor immunology, and we kind of wrap this up in, in the atlas to have it. Or like more automatically applicable. Mm -hmm. for I, I forgot the announcing for context. This question was from Katharina M. Keller, in case you, you watch follow up later. Yeah. Um, all right, so the next one uh, is from Dario Rigadli. Uh, thanks, great talk. Is the spotlight package in Bioconductor? If not, do you plan to submit it? Not yet. <laughs> Mark, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a problem with dependencies that are not directly compatible with Bioconductor, but the Review 3 asked for that as well. So I think we're on. Okay, so maybe Dario again is <laughs> Review 3. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, uh, those, those are the kind of things that could yeah. also be. Uh, it's, it's our intention to have that like broadly uh, applied by the community. And yeah. Yeah, we have coders in GitHub, and we kind of open everything uh, as much as possible to have many people using the Atlas and uh, related tools, papers on bioarchive, uh, Spotlight, and the Atlas. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's uh, I really appreciated that uh, that you know all the data could we could go download them now and, and start playing with it, which is pretty cool. Um, so the next question is uh, from Ciro Ramirez Suastegui. Uh, by the end of the Week, I will be able to pronounce your name, I promise. Um, but uh, according to the code, you remove genes differentially expressed between data sets before choosing anchoring features. Uh, did you check if this is removing biologically relevant genes? Yes. So, in general, this is kind of, we were a little bit careful integrating data sets and then checking if we don't, if we don't induce technical bias. Was, there's no really ground truth, but kind of was really ensuring for us detecting the clusters in, in many, basically all patients or hundreds, more than hundreds of patients and across cancer types. So after integration, I think we, we kind of removed the technical bias. Uh, we might have been too harsh in removing biology, but we've seen all the expected cell states and clusters. Um, yeah, but it's probably the lack of ground truth. That, uh, yeah. It doesn't, yeah, it's a, it's a it's probably wrong to say this is the, the, the most correct way. But in terms of like technical and expected biology, I think it's uh, it's a ro robust reference to apply. 
Great. And then uh, we have a question by Adin Kulain. Um, what resources data do you find most useful for calling cell types? What uh, could Bioconductor add? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for most of the uh, projects, we kind of make up our own uh, signature, signature database, um, uh, reference markers. Um, hiring an immunologist was a game changer. So it, just having a background of how, how cell states are, are generated and how they function in tissues, that really made a difference. Um, yeah, but that's, I think that's, that's desperately needed by the community to have a more automated uh, notation system. But there's, there's like working groups in the cell atlas working on this for like reference atlases of healthy tissues. But this is obviously also needed for diseases. Yeah, and uh, you know, Martin has done uh, some some nice packages to to grab the data from the human cell atlas directly in Bioconductor. So uh, people <laughs> interested in that can <laughs> can explore uh, Martin's packages. So um, I think with this, I, I think why why data sets are generating and the resources or the references are getting larger and more complete. I think yeah, and it's it's also a good starting point. Uh, discussing how this can be transferred. Yeah, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, what Martin uh, mentioned about Experiment Hub and these, uh, you know, cloud-based resources where you can, um, you know, store a large amount of data and then download only the one that you need for the particular project is, is going to be the key for, for smaller labs to be able to kind of uh, leverage yeah. the resources by this uh, large consortia. All right, so um, I, I think I'll uh, thank Holger again for his wonderful talk. And uh, with this, we conclude the first session of the conference. And uh, there's a 10 minute break, and we will see you at uh, 3.40 for those of you who are in Europe um, uh, for, uh, for the session too. Okay, thanks a lot, bye-bye.